Hey guys, welcome back to the shack and I've been out here trying to catch up on some jobs building a whole bunch of stove covers and other projects. You've probably seen some pictures. Uh, I've been trying to post some photos and stuff like that of some of the jobs I've been working on and in the process of posting those pictures, of course, more orders keep rolling in. Uh, but I'm out here trying to get them caught up. But in the meantime, guys, while I've been working on these other projects, I have been letting things run on the CNC and kind of mixing in a little CNC training, a little CNC work. And I have finally completed my first 3D engrave. And despite the fact that I'm a total noob and I really don't understand all the ins and outs of the CNC yet, I wanted to update you guys on where I'm at in my adventure of learning CNC work. Some of the things that I've picked up from a lot of you guys, uh, a lot of other YouTubers, and as well as my friend Steve over at Vintari's Workshops, give me some tips. And a few of my local guys that are here around, like my buddy over at Tips Hammer. Uh, he's gave me some tips because he's, which is coincidental, tip gave me tips. But anyway, uh, he gave me a few things to try and some tricks that he uses. He has a similar CNC. It's a little bigger, but same principles. And uh, some of his information has been really useful. So if you're interested in where I'm at on the journey, what I've learned, and what you guys need to be looking for as you continue down this journey that is CNCs, if you choose to do so, then stick around. I'm going to show you some of the things I've done to the machine, the upgrades I've made, things I've learned, and all that. All right, guys. So one of the, the most Im biggest improvements that I have found, uh, I'm not knocking the original spindle that came with the machine, for, for small stuff, and if you're not in a hurry, it does a decent job. But in order to turn out the type of projects that I do and be able to do it in a reasonable amount of time, uh, total game changer here, guys. Now, I also have added myself a switch that makes the router activated through the software. Because if you don't do that, then you have to actually turn this off and on instead of doing it in the software. But I've put a relay in here that enables me to activate the DeWalt with the software. And that is great. Uh, I'm also, I've got another chip extraction set up coming to uh, hook to this because the shop vac, although it works, it's very loud. I've been wearing my, my uh, Bluetooth headset in here when I'm working just to kind of you know keep from having to listen to it. But what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna mount me a uh, a dust collector over here that's going to be a lot quieter uh, and still be able to extract the chips and stuff. And I'm going to hook it up also to where when the spindle comes on, it comes on. So look forward to that uh, upgrade later on eventually. As soon as I can get around to it. I've got it ordered, but it's going to probably be a week or so before I get it in. Uh, the spool board is still working great. Uh, with spool boards and with locking down the material, guys, there's two different trains of thought. All right, so my friend Steve, y'all all know Steve, all right? Steve gave me a tip, and this is what I've been using so far, uh, on using painter's tape, CA glue, and activator. And I'm not going to do an in-depth video on it because there's lots of guys out there that have done that already. But basically what it boils down to is you put a strip of uh, painter's tape on your spoil board, then you apply the CA glue, then you take and you make sure that you have those same size strips of painter's tape on the back of your workpiece, take it away from here, spray the activator on there, and literally when you set it down on the workspace, it's, it's there, okay? My friend Tip over at Tip's Hammer, uh, he, he told me to use some of this uh, car, uh, woodworker's tape. I've used it for mounting a few things, um, some of my designs on the wall, works great for that, and it's actually removable. Uh, I haven't got to use it in the CNC yet because I, I, the design that I worked on today, which I'm going to show you in the video here, uh, I had already done with Steve's approach. And it worked great. Piece didn't come loose. The one piece of advice I will give you when you get ready to, if you do that, when you get ready to remove it, instead of using a screwdriver, get yourself a nice flat chisel. Uh, because all I had to do was put the chisel under there, bump it a little bit, and pry up, and it popped right up. No problem, but you know, this is like a one inch wide flat chisel. It worked really well because you can actually set it up against your spool board and not gonna damage the spool board, but it kind of acts as a ramp to 
to kind of push that piece up. That worked really what really great. I tried using other things that didn't work as well because there was so little clearance. The screwdriver was going to either damage my piece or damage the board. This seems to be the best approach. So with that said, it's a lot better, guys, because when you're new like me, I don't exactly understand how the machine is going to be moving around. I was a little nervous about those big metal wing nuts and the metal clamps uh, being anywhere near my work area. And so that's why I wanted to go to more of a glue down or some type of non-damaging material to hold my stuff in place. And that works a lot better. Another thing that I'm having to learn, guys, and I've, I've used the lasers to kind of make myself some cheat sheets. This is uh, basically when I ordered my bits through Amazon from uh, Jinmitsu, I went on there and took the pictures that they had explaining all the measurements and stuff for the bits and uh, made them into a burn file so that I could have me a little cheat sheet. Because the thing that you do have to know is you have to know the dimensions of the bits when you're setting up the design. Uh, you have up cut bits, down cut bits, uh, round nose, V bits. There's a whole slew of different bits that do different things. And uh, I'm gonna go over the bits that I used for the project I did today with you uh, here in just a second. But so far, guys the, guys, the machine's working really well. I'm still running Easel. I'm fixing to go ahead and commit to a year subscription to Easel because it works for me. It's pretty simple. It has a pretty vast library of already made designs that you can use to create things. If you saw the, the video I did the other day about the three different methods of making those river signs, the one that had the color I actually did on a CNC and the graphics in that burn were like stock images from easel. And I've been kind of looking through there. They have a pretty extensive library of, you know, pieces and compliments for burns that you can use and you don't have to go looking for them or you know trying to get them off the internet or anything like that so I'm gonna run I'm at least gonna do a year's worth of easel there's some other softwares out there I want to try as well but I've got to start making some money with this machine to pay for all of my upgrades so in the meantime I'm gonna get me a subscription to easel turn out some products and try to get my money back for the investments that I put into the machine and uh, go from there and Guys, I know the thing's small. Steve reminds me that it's a baby. But for what I do, because most of the stuff that I do, I typically do it on either a laser or I can do it on this. And the one thing that I have learned with this machine, because the ends are open, other than my little, you know, makeshift uh, hose holder I've got right here, if I need to do something, you know, do a sign that is longer, I can actually set it up here adhere it to the table, do the one part of the burn, and then move it over and do another one. And I could do longer items. Now, I try to avoid that. Anything that's that big, typically I'm gonna do it on my long frame laser uh, and not use the CNC. But I am just touching the, the, the tip of the iceberg when it comes to these files. And also, uh, I don't wanna mention his name because <laughs> one of my subscribers and one of the followers, and he is a normal attendee in our lives, uh, appreciate you loaning me the file that I used today. Uh, I'm not going to be selling it. Uh, the thing that I made today, uh, my daughter has already came in and laid claim to it. It's hers. She's going to assist me with the project. And uh, so I'm not taking your files and making money off of them. I do appreciate you loaning them to me so I could try them out. Uh, but uh, but that, that was a pretty, pretty awesome file. It was a big learning curve. Uh, but so far, guys, that's the gist of it. I will tell you, the one thing that I did, the other thing that I did do, I did this today, is the, uh, this is the dust shoe that comes with this machine if you get it for the DeWalt router. And when I got this, it only had a hole here for the, you know, when it slides up there, it has to go over the router. And this wasn't here. I added this. And the reason I added this, guys, is the base right here that goes with the dust shoe. This is the part that has the magnets and everything that holds it in place. Well, the base is clear. It's clear acrylic, so you, it's transparent. You can see through it. And the DeWalt, it has LED lights under here that shine down on your work material. So I, I found it kind of bad that I couldn't look in there and see, because when I'm adjusting the speeds, and that's one thing that I have learned too, is you kind of, depending on the wood that you use, you know, you're gonna, you, I, there was not a predetermined setting for that bit, this router, and pecan wood in easel. If there was, it's not in the free version or the trial version. So I basically used the settings for hard maple because that was the hardest wood that they had listed. 
And then as the, as the cut was running, I just kind of listened to my buddy Tip tell me to listen to the router and it'll tell you if you're going too fast or too slow. So I listened to the router and I just kind of walked the speed up just a little until it got to where it, it felt like, it sounded like it might've been a little too much on the router, like it was putting a little too much pressure. And then I backed it down one step on uh, easel. And it worked great. It shaved some time off of the, the burn, the cut time. Uh, it didn't scorch my wood, no burning, no chipping, no you know, slinging chunks out or anything like that. But in order to do that, I like to be able to see exactly what the bit is doing uh, and making sure that it's not leaving a black mark and that type of thing. Well, with this thing being closed in like this, you can't see the bit. So what I did is I took this over to the 30 watt, the longer, and set it up in my workspace and made me a little shape and I lined it with the camera and framed it out. And I've cut me a section right here and I'm gonna drop a photo so you can see exactly what the view looks like. But when this is on there now, and the lights are on, standing right here, I can see right beside the hose, I can see the bit. Now I may have to go down or up, depending on how long the bit is, but I can actually see the bit as it's cutting the wood to see you know, how the cut's performing. Do I need to slow down or do I need to speed up? That was very helpful. And if Jinmitsu, if you would, feel free, you know, feel free to copy that little cut right there and add that to it. It's a big, it, it makes a big difference with the DeWalt. If it didn't have the lights already, if this wasn't clear, that wouldn't be an issue. But, but that was one more selling point for this dust shoe, in my opinion. It, that's a selling point because now you can actually look in there and see exactly how your bit's responding to the wood. So, but anyway, let's get over to the project. And I've talked enough about the machine. So far, no issues, guys. Uh, People have said that I was going to have some flexing when running the machine and it was going to cause some issues because the bigger router and small machine. But guys, I'm, I haven't seen it. I ran the speeds pretty high today. Uh, I will say that if you run the bit down far enough, uh, I accidentally did that because it, it's kind of like driving a boat when you move this. You have to release the button a little early before you want it to stop because these gears still continue to push it. And I pushed... I pushed really hard here and it did move up just a little, but it, it was very, very minimal. But uh, so far it's been real rigid. I haven't had the nerve to try out the fourth axis yet. I'm working my way up to that, but, uh, but that is an option in the future once I get my head wrapped around everything else. I don't want to go throw that fourth dimension in there on me just yet. So let's move over and look at the project. All right, guys. So all you pros out there, I know I probably messed up somewhere on this, but there's one thing that I will tell you. I learned something about pecan wood today because I never used pecan wood for anything other than, you know, I've had a few people requested something on a really piece of hardwood. I have used pecan in cutting boards because it's really, really hard. So a lot of times I mix this in with black walnut to, to make a cutting board. And the reason is, is because it's really hard. So your cutting board doesn't just like whittle away. But I learned today that pecan engraves nicely. So this project has actually turned into a CNC and laser project. So there's, there's the engraved guys. And I know some folks have gave Steve a hard time because he called something, he said he did a 3D engrave and they said it's technically not 3D, but you can't say that on this. Guys, this is 3D, okay? I didn't cut it all the way out because I wanted to make something like what is here now. Uh, and when my daughter saw it, she decided she wants it. I'll go ahead and warn you guys, my daughter is the artistic member of our family and she's really, really good with insects and insect drawing. So she is gonna take this and she is gonna try to make this as realistic as she can make it. And then once she does that, we've discussed you know, maybe dropping some epoxy over the top of it or something like that to kind of seal it permanently. Uh, or either we'll just put a lot of clear coat on it, one of the two. But I think it turned out pretty well. I did a lot of hand sanding with it. After, uh, after I got it out of the CNC, I hand sanded it and uh, took it over to the laser, put it in my squaring jig, built me a little frame line around it, and we did the, the text alignment. She picked out the fonts and uh, all that for the, for the burn. And then she's going to take it off and do the painting. But I've told her that once she gets this completed, once this is completely done, she's going to have to come explain to you guys how she done it. Because 
I don't know anything about what she's going to do with this, but I promise you, and I'll try to find a couple of the pictures she's done and drop those up there where you can see them, but it, it'll look cool when she gets done with it. Now, it may take her a while, but there'll be a part two later. All right, guys, so that's going to be it for today. I have been working on stove covers. I've turned out, I think, eight in the past few days, five or six bamboo cutting boards, two or three signs, and I'm working on a project right now for my friend May May, and I'm gonna try to make a video with that uh, to show you kind of how I do that. Uh, she's asked me to make a door reef for her, for her business, and I've got most of the parts put together. I've been doing a little B-roll clips during the process, and we'll try to throw that together for you guys. But I just wanted to share this project. I mean, I am proud of this. My very first 3D with the CNC, and I did not destroy it. I uh, was a little nervous about the bit change, and the reason I say that, guys, is I used an upcut bit for the roughing because it's removing more material, and that kind of pulls the material out of the hole as it cuts through it, especially with the pecan. I was afraid if that material stayed in the hole as it was cutting that it would dull the blade faster or the bit faster and maybe cause some problems with burning and scorching inside there. So the bit that I used for the roughing was a quarter-inch uh, upcut with a flat tip, and then once I let that run, that process took around six hours yesterday. I was working on other stuff, just kind of babysitting it while I did my other things. And then I got up this morning, come out here about 7 o'clock, got it back started. And the finishing part of it took, I think it was four and a half hours with that. It was an eighth inch down cut flat tip bit that I did the, the finishing with. And of course, then I had to go in and touch it up with some sandpaper because there were some little lines that I didn't like. Uh, but I did that by hand. Uh, and if you know, if you know an easier way, I, I really wish there was like a sanded stick that I could get for some of those cracks, like a toothpick that has sandpaper on it or something. Uh, and there probably is, I just haven't found it yet. But I was able to take me a little piece of quarter, quarter sheet of sandpaper and go in there and clean that up. And we did the engrave, did the outside of it with sandpaper and it's off to Abby for the rest of the process. But so far guys, I'm, I'm digging the machine. I like it. Y'all all said that I would be addicted to it if I ever got one and guys, you're right. I'm enjoying it. Uh, it, it's added another facet to my business and I'm actually getting requests for jobs done on the machine now. And like today, guys, I had this machine running on cutting boards. I had this machine running on stove covers and I had the CNC working on this guy. And that's how I maximize my profit. Uh, because if I got enough machines spinning up, you know, my hourly income goes up instead of me just standing here propped up waiting on the laser to finish. You know, I've got other things going on. So that's how people asked how I managed to make money doing this. That's it, because I've got my little robots. I'll have three robots running, and then I've got my, my headphones on, and I'm over here turning out stove covers and just keeping an eye on everybody. So that's what it's all about, maximizing your efficiency and your productivity. And I do that by the use of multiple machines instead of doing it by the use of $10,000 machines. So tip for the day. Sometimes it's not about how big a machine you have, but how many machines you have. So until next time, guys, be safe and have a good day.